I'm proceeding in my series of messages on the books of the Bible. And today my topic is First Chronicles and the theme is Israel Reviewed. And I'll explain what I mean by that a little bit later. But let's turn to the last chapter in First Chronicles where we find David as he comes to the end of his life praising God for his blessings. David lived a very turbulent, in many ways troubled life. Like all of us, he had many blessings and successes, but he had his failures as well. But we find his heart full of praise. And so in 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 10, we begin. Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as were all our fathers, our days on earth are as a shadow and without down in verse 20 it says, And David said to all the assembly, Now bless the Lord your God. So all the assembly blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed their heads and prostrated themselves before the Lord and the king. The books of First and Second Kings on the one hand and First and Second Chronicles on the other hand cover many of the same periods of time in the history of Israel. And so it's a logical question. What is the difference? Why does God include many of the same events in his word? Well, there is a difference. It's generally believed that First and Second Kings emphasizes the political life of Israel. The outward kingdom, the kings and the struggles, the battles, the idolatry. Whereas First and Second Chronicles focus on the inner life of Israel. And we see what God is doing and what is going on in the hearts and lives of the spiritual element in the kingdom. Now, as we left... Uh, the book of 2 Kings last week, I suppose you could say it was rather discouraging because we find the northern kingdom, which was begun by Jeroboam the first, turning from God. In spite of all God's blessings, in spite of all that God had done for them, we find them building high places on the mountains and bowing down to pagan kings in spite of the faithful warnings of the prophets, who week after week, day after day, came and gave them the truth, they did not listen. They hardened their hearts against God. And so 2 Kings ends in judgment. As God sends a foreign nation who do not know him against his own people, they conquer the northern kingdom. Samaria falls somewhere around 720 B.C. And so the ten tribes of Israel are scattered throughout the east. That leaves only the southern kingdom, Judah, with their capital at Jerusalem. But as we come to 1 Chronicles, we find hope. And we find that God is still at work. That he's not forsaken his people. 
that he is reviving his people from time to time. And in the midst of all the corruption and in the midst of all the apostasy and the idolatry and the hard-heartedness, there are good people. There are godly kings. There's revival. There's reformation going on from time to time. And so I think we can see clearly an analogy even as we trace the history of the church of Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ has been on this earth for 2,000 years. There have been ebbs and flows in the history of the church. There have been times of great apostasy. There have been times when whole denominations turned away from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and incorporated into their religious exercises, ideas, philosophies that are not scriptural. But at the same time, as we look through history, we see how God, even in the darkest hours, has worked mightily, has raised up faithful preachers, faithful denominations, faithful churches to shine forth the light of truth. We must remember Jesus built the church. And he's not going to forsake it. And he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, it just occurred to me something that someone inquired about a few weeks ago, and I happen to know a little something about it. A strange movement has developed in Christendom. It's a movement to get everyone to desert completely the organized church, the visible church. It's led by a man who has many good ideas as far as theology is concerned. As a matter of fact, he's the founder and director of what's known as Family Radio. I don't know how many of you may have heard it, but he has suddenly decided that we're in the tribulation period and the age of the church is over, that God has abandoned the church. And so he's counseling all these people that listen to him to leave the church, that God is no longer using the church. Don't listen to the pastors. Don't listen to the deacons and elders. God's finished with the church. Now, just listen to me. Stay home. Turn on the radio. I will send you books and tracts. Gather the people in families, and that's the way God is working. Now, who do we believe, Harold Camping or Jesus? Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yes, there are times when we get discouraged perhaps and the church does things it shouldn't. It's made up of imperfect people after all. But if you go home and pull in the, uh, crawl in a hole and pull the dirt in on you, so to speak, you're just hurting yourself, you're isolating yourself from the very institution that God has chosen. Now, in 1 Chronicles, we find the Lord going back and sort of encapsulating some of the things that have happened spiritually during all the days of the apostasy that we've talked about. As a matter of fact, it goes all the way back to the beginning. First Chronicles starts out with Adam. <laughs> Adam. And so we find then a long catalog of names. Of people who appeared on the stage of history, had children and grandchildren, and then they're listed and God passes on to other people. Here you have the story of human reproduction. Now, records, genealogy is important. Maybe many of you have uh, taken on yourself the job of tracing your family tree. And you may have found out that there are some rather bad birds who have lodged in that tree. And you may have gotten discouraged because your uh, investigations may have taken you through prisons and jails or maybe even worse. Well, God recognizes the importance of records and people and so don't 
don't uh, be discouraged by all these begats, begats, because God's put them there for a purpose. It's important. And yet we also are reminded that it takes no grace, it takes no spirituality to have babies and to produce children. Every now and then you run into some fellow you know who uh, brags about all the kids he's had with all these different women. And I'm thinking of one particular NBA, former NBA star who showed up with uh, uh, HIV positive and he was talking about all the different women that he had accommodated in his life. And he said, I, I try to accommodate as many women as I can. And no telling how many little children he brought into the world without providing a home for them. Folks, it don't take any brains to have babies. All it takes is some hormones. But you know something? As we pass through this series of begats and begats and this genealogy, all of a sudden, boom. God stops and says, hey, here's someone that was different. In the list of humanity, in the catalog of human records, here and there we find people who were different because they sought the Lord. And God takes note of that. And I would like to encourage you to be different. Don't be like everybody else. Don't be like the people who are just having babies and aren't making homes. Don't do that. Don't just be a number or a statistic. Be different. Stand out. How are you at, at being different? Sometimes I believe the Lord calls His children just to sort of stand alone. Maybe in a certain context anyway. No one seems to be with me. Here I am in this office or in this school. No one believes like I do. Am I crazy or what? One such individual was a man named Jabez. Oh, I love this guy. Begat, 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 and though we have all these generations and so forth. And then all of a sudden, over in the fourth chapter... The Lord just sort of stops and says, wait, here's someone who's different. In the fourth chapter in verse 10 it says, And Jabez called on the God of Israel. That made him different. All these other people were going up and offering sacrifices to Baal and Ashtoreth and all these false gods and causing their children to pass through the fire. But Jabez called on the Lord. And it says that he prayed. He prayed, Lord, bless me indeed and enlarge my territory that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil so I may not cause pain. Or I think one translation, so I may not grieve you. So God granted his request. Now this is chapter 4 of 1 Chronicles verse 10. Yes, Jabez was different. Jabez had a heart. Jabez had a conscience. Jabez had standards. And Jabez reached up and grabbed the very hand of God. And prayed and God blessed him. And he became a success in life. A lot of these characters that were recorded here in Chronicles came on the stage of history, passed away, were failures, messed up, served false gods, but not Jabez. He was a shining example of faith in prayer. I assure you, my friends, that if you are a different person, if you're a praying person, you'll be a blessed person. You'll be a person that God will listen to. And you'll see your prayers answered. Try it. I told you that Chronicles was going to illustrate 
some of the people who are spiritual. I go come over to the fifth chapter here for a moment. And we find here another group of people in the family of God who are from the children of Gad. Now, what do you know about the tribe of Gad? That was one of the tribes of, uh, of Israel. Gad was one of the sons of Jacob. Some of the other tribes were more important, more powerful. The tribe of Judah, bigger, had a more prominent place in Israel's history. Even Benjamin, more said about that. But this tribe of Gad had some people who sought God. Down in verse 20 of chapter 5 it says, And they were helped against them, that is, they were their enemies, and the Hagrites were delivered into their hand, and all who were with them, for they cried out to God in the battle. He heeded their prayer because they put their trust in him. Now God had called the Israelites to go into the land of Canaan to dispossess the pagans there, to drive them out. And so the tribe of Gad came against these people called the Hagrites. Now you have all these ites in the Bible. Amalekites, Ammonites, Moabites, Perizzites, Termites, I guess. I know all kinds of ites. But here are the Hagrites. Now, the ites are always against Israel. But the Hagrites picked on the wrong group because they were trusting in the Lord. The ites should never mess with praying people. Shouldn't do it. Because you're up against odds that you can't overcome. Brothers and sisters, we have Hagrites all around us. We have people who don't believe in God. They're fighting the truth. They're fighting the church. They're fighting the standards of the Word of God. So what are we going to do? Sharpen our swords? Get bigger armies? No. The first thing we do is we ask help of the Lord. I believe the Lord sometimes backs us against the wall. And makes us feel just how helpless we are for the simple reason that when he does that, then we cry out to him. And then he comes and as our helper, our, our aid, and he sees our enemies put down. Praise God for victory in his name. Now, we find not only that God's people in Chronicles were a praying people, but they were energetic and active people. As you go through this book of... Uh, Chronicles, you're going to see that everybody has a job. Everybody's doing something for the Lord. Not all have the same job. Some are public, some are private. But you know, every little member of the body of Christ is important. Every person in the church, if you join the church, if you're a part of the body of Christ, God has something for you to do. You might not be able to play an organ or a piano or preach or teach, but you can do something. You can pray. You know, we had this uh, uh, sale yesterday, and there were people who were taking money. There were people cooking hot dogs. Uh, some people can cook, some can't. Some people can write. Some people can fix electric uh, currents and so forth. Some people can work with computers. Everybody, though, has a job. And so really, uh, pray about what the Lord wants you to do in this church if you're a member. And, and uh, be active. Do something. Over in the ninth chapter, we find the gatekeepers. Just, just, I'm giving some examples. The gatekeepers. Now, gatekeeping, that doesn't sound like such a big job, does it? But yet, that's important. They were taking care of the gates of, the, of Jerusalem, 
uh, attending to, and these weren't just, you know, these little gates that swing back and forth. These were big, huge arches where people came and went. In the gates of Israel, there were people who met, the elders of the uh, of the uh, community met there, and the king sat there and deliberated with his cabinet. And it says in verse 27 of, of 1 Chronicles 9, they lodged all around the house of God because they had the responsibility. And they were in charge of opening it every morning. You know, we, we live in a day and age when people, I mean, a lot of people think that the world owes them everything. They don't have to work. They can get on welfare. I had a fellow tell me one time, he said, I don't have to work. I can make more on, you know, just sitting at home. Let the government take care of me. And also, you know, we all, we all have something to blame for why uh, we do bad things. Mommy took my dolly away from me when I was six, and that's why I beat my wife. Thank you, Sigmund Freud. We're not responsible. It's our genes. I was born into this world to be violent. I was born into this world to be a homosexual. I was born in this world to be angry. I was born into this world to be a drunk. I can't help it. You see, all this nonsense, no one seems to believe in responsibility today. And I hate to say it, a lot of Christians seem to be the same way. Responsibility seems a word that we, we, we don't know about. And sometimes people take jobs in the church and they don't live up to their obligations. They're not dependable. Many years ago... Uh, a, a, a nice young fellow I knew came into our church, and I, he seemed bright. And I put him in. A, we put him in a job to teach Sunday school, and sometimes he'd show up, and sometimes he didn't. And he was really surprised when I told him that, "Look, we have Sunday school at nine fifteen, and you should be here to teach because you took the job." Oh, really? You see, these gatekeepers had the responsibility. I, I like that word, responsibility. And I want to say something. Uh, parents had better start teaching children responsibility. And, and uh, there's responsibility at the work, at the job, to be there on time, to do your job, to put in the full time you're supposed to. It's not honest not to. So God's people are energetic and active. Thirdly, we find in Chronicles, God's people are a praising people. So we find a lot in 1 Chronicles about praising the Lord. David was a great leader. And uh, he led the people in prayer. He, he set an example. I just read this wonderful uh, praise uh, Psalm over in the 29th chapter. And he got up before the people and he thanked God for all the blessings. And that's what the preachers are to do and the elders of the church are to do is to lead the people in praise, to make them a praising people. When we come together here on Sunday, when we sing, we're to join in praising God. We're to thank Him for our blessings. We're to thank Him that we can get out of bed, that we can be in church. David was a musician, and we find how he organized choirs and how he had people playing trumpets and musical instruments. Look in chapter 15, verse 16. It says, Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers accompanied by instruments of music. Stringed instruments. Harps and cymbals by raising their voices with resounding joy. I'm afraid a lot of people go to church 
and the leader gets up and announces a song and they just go through the motions. They mouth the words, but they are not joining in the praise themes and praise feelings that the author of the praise music or the hymn really expressed. Oh, friends, listen. When we sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, we ought to enter in to the spirit of that. I've listened to Dottie Rambo recently uh, talking about her inspiration as a writer, one of the great Christian musicians of our day. And uh, Bill Gaither asked her uh, who had inspired her. And she said, Fanny Crosby. I found out everything I could about Fanny Crosby, that blind hymn writer. Blessed assurance. All the way my Savior leads me, safe in the arms of Jesus. All these wonderful hymns written by this godly woman. So let me just encourage you, that is to really put our heart and soul into the praise of the Lord here. And when the trumpets sound and the organ and the piano sound and when the choir sings, may it be to the praise of God, may joy resound from the sanctuary, forgetting our problems and setting aside our negative feelings and Honoring God. We find in the Chronicles several wonderful prayers of praise. Chapter 16 is a big song of thanksgiving. Boy, it's wonderful. Chapter 16, verse 24. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. Verse 29. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of of holiness. Holiness is beautiful. Praise is beautiful. Verse 36 of chapter 16. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people said amen and praise the Lord. Yes, we've got to be a praising people. And so we find in First Chronicles that God's people are a people that bless the Lord, that thank the Lord, that, that honor God, that are filled with joy. Why is it that some people come to church or maybe even get up and sing in the choir and look like they're going to hang in? I don't know. Yes, we should be full of praise. We should be full of thanksgiving. But not only are God's people in Chronicles a praying people, energetic people, and a, pra and a praising people, but they're a believing people. Now, here's my last point today. In First Chronicles, we find God's covenant promises emphasized. And I want to just use David as an example in chapter 17. David's was blessed with a covenant from God. A covenant of grace. There are two kinds of covenants in the Bible. There's the conditional covenants where blessings depend on our obedience and then there's those amazing promises of grace where God says, in spite of your sin, I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to take care of you. Well, here in the 17th chapter, we have a covenant of grace God makes with David. And he renews his promise to David in verses 1 through 14. I'm not going to read it. But God says, I'm going to build your house and establish it forever. And I'm going to establish your kingdom and your son after you. And your throne will be established forever. And David believed this. In spite of his sin, in spite of his weaknesses, in spite of his failures... David embraced a covenant keeping God. The Bible tells us that our salvation does not depend on our good works. Our happiness does. Rewards to a degree do. Our health maybe even does. But our salvation is based on a covenant of grace. God chose David out of his family and made him king. 
And that's why he was so happy. That's why he danced before the ark. When his wife, the daughter of Saul, couldn't understand it. He believed the promise of God. He claimed it. And in the Psalms of David, we find the testimonies of a man who faced the troubles of life, the problems of life, his own griefs and failures, with joy and confidence because of faith in God. And that's why he saw God as the great shepherd. Why he'd been out in the fields taking care of sheep, he knew, what it was to, to, he knew what it was to protect a sheep from the bear and the lion. And so when he thought of the Lord, he could think of no better analogy than his own role as a shepherd as he looked out for the little lambs, pulling them out of the ditch, protecting them from the snakes and the bears and the lions. And that's why he said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's why he said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all my iniquities, who healeth all my diseases, who crowns my life with loving kindness and tender mercies. Oh, my friends, dig into the well of God's grace. Put your bucket down deep into the water. David experienced grace and he believed in the covenant of grace. Folks, if our safety and our security individually or corporately were to depend on what we are or do, we'd be sunk. I believe God's grace spans from eternity past to eternity future. From the election of grace to glorification of grace. And in time, justification and calling. And so we need to rely on the covenant of grace. And in the New Testament we find this promise of Jesus Christ. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Spurgeon has a sermon on that text. Never, 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 never. That's its topic. And it's because there are five negatives in that verse of Scripture. Jesus said literally, I will never, 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 never leave you nor forsake you. That's grace. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear? The hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. It was grace that brought me safe thus far. It's all of grace. Sweet grace. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Our song books are full of grace. Ah, we have a lot to praise the Lord for. And I'll tell you, First Chronicles shows the inner life of Israel. It shows the, the Israel that God's blessing on an individual basis of the souls that are crying out to God in the darkest hours. So we need people today who are crying out to God in this dark hour. We had a Black Monday this week. Black, Black Monday. As for the first time... An ungodly practice was legitimized in one of our states, but we must not give up. We need to pray for uh, Dr. Dobson and others who are leading the way in the, uh, trying to maintain marriage and write our congressman about this uh, attempt to preserve marriage in our country. But we, we shouldn't get discouraged. We shouldn't get depressed and negative for God is sovereign he is on the throne God is with his people and so 
as we revisit the history of Israel and God goes through back to Adam and takes us in 1 Chronicles all the way to David, we end up in praise. We end up on the mountaintop. We end up shouting hallelujah. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gifts.